sighted on a desolate coastal bluff more than 600 miles south of the US border. It's hard to imagine a more well-known but remote surf destination than San Juanico. Yet its very isolation is its appeal. The coastal plains of Baja Sur are panoramic desert vistas framed by primeval mountain ranges and fringed with thick cardon cactus forests. It's a land of stark contrasts, where the desert abruptly ends and the endless blue Pacific begins. Along a narrow ribbon of asphalt dotted with outpost towns and small farms, its dusty, hand-hewn Mexican culture is a callback to Wild West frontier days. But beneath its arid, often forbidding exterior lies an incredibly rich ecosystem teeming with life and incredible diversity. Cuando yo me vine aquí a la orilla de la playa, allí en una cueva, y tenía una niña nomás, la mayor, la mía, que fue el 48. El primerito que vino aquí fue Jaime, y yo tal Esteban, ahí dejaba de comer yo porque me pedían gente en un avión grande para que les diera de comer. Y después ya empezó a venir otros y otros y otros y ya. Y de allí para adelante yo puse el restaurante para que daban ellos de comer ahí también. I arrived in this town the first time in 1976 and it was hard to find this place back in those days and very protected. My first night here I had a knock on the door of a camper I was staying in and from a person named Mike Perry who worked with Surfer Magazine at that time and he wanted to know exactly who told me how to get here. We started to fly my airplane back down here every chance we got. When I discovered this place, I'd been from San Diego to Peru looking for this place. I found a couple places that I wanted, but I didn't know the best place was in my backyard. Once I found this place, then my whole life changed. Everything was, from then on out, it was San Juan Eagle. Baja Sur's coastal waters on both sides of the peninsula are a diver's paradise ranging from tropical reefs to cathedral-like kelp forests. Its priceless natural repository of undersea wildlife has earned it the nickname, the Aquarium of the World. I have been personally visiting and studying San Juanico for about 20 years. San Juanico is a very unique area along the Baja California Peninsula. It has a long continental shelf which provides sort of nursery area for a lot of fish and fisheries that are important to the community and also is very near the southern limit of kelp forests in the northern hemisphere. So it's a very biologically diverse environment and with that diversity comes lots of productivity and with that productivity comes pretty amazing fisheries. But it's just offshore of the large headland that frames the northern end of Bahia de San Juanico that bathymetry, swell and tide conspire to produce a jewel of a wave that can reel flawlessly for more than 400 yards on the biggest and best days. The wave, dubbed Scorpion Bay, is actually four separate point waves that offer a full range of size and conditions, from a gentle beginner's peeler to a triple overhead freight train screamer best tackled by experts only. No one is quite sure who was the very first to surf Scorpion Bay, but by the mid-1970s there was a small cadre of hardcore surfers driving or flying down each summer to spend weeks camping on the point, waiting for a rumoured south swell to hit. When I came across the quality of wave in Scorpion, I realised that God only made that very few, probably ten in the world. The, the length of this right-handed break and the quality of, of the wave itself was something that I had never even seen before and I had surfed just about in every continent. But by the mid-1980s, word had gotten out and photos of Scorpion Bay, then named Punta Pequeña, were appearing in the surf magazines. The new surf gold rush was on and by the early 90s there could be over 150 surfers converged on first point. 
Scorpion Bay was known for kind of some hostility towards anybody that didn't really, uh, they did not want the public knowing about the quality of the waves. So it was a big shh kind of thing going on. They turned the signs around or knocked signs down. They downplayed it. They called it Scorpion Bay because they wanted people to think about scorpions and not wanting to go there. This sudden influx of surfers during the prime swell window quickly strained San Juanico's fragile desert ecosystem and overwhelmed the town's limited infrastructure. The point became a no-man's land of windblown trash soiled with impromptu pit toilets. Baja Flag became the nickname for the ubiquitous streamers of used toilet paper flying across the landscape. While the act of wave riding leaves little to no trace, the impact of access and surf tourism can be profound, especially on rural coastlines in developing countries. Starting in the 1960s with pioneering surfers, there has been a history of a good surf break attracting a chain of haphazard and unsustainable development. Cuda Beach, Tamarindo and Nias are often held up as cautionary tales of the dream of the endless summer turning a once pristine coastline into a surf slum. Tamarindo, they have several really good surf breaks and um, in the early 90s there was a movie Endless Summer 2 which kind of showed that that was there and available and so a lot of outside interest came in to develop that surf tourism asset with lodging and accommodations and other services and it happened so rapidly that development went unchecked and now there's a lot of problems with waste management, wastewater treatment, transportation, um, employment and opportunities such as that um, that's kind of ruined what that place used to be and what it could have been. San Juanico currently has a year-round population of close to a thousand but it's estimated that 50,000 people visit San Juanico each year. As the once vibrant fishing industry that supported the original Ejido declines, the residents are increasingly dependent on tourism to survive. In my personal experience in the 20 years I've been there, I have seen pretty incredible changes with both their target species and the amount of organisms they're able to fish sustainably. But in the time that I've been um, working and studying in San Juanico, I have watched the co-op reduce um, substantially their sustainable catch of abalone and had to switch to other organisms because abalone was no longer feasible. They used to fish abalone most of spring and now I think they only fish for a few weeks because their quota has been reduced so much because it's just not sustainable anymore. So how do we help create a vibrant, sustainable, surf-centric community from tourism in a fragile desert ecosystem with limited natural resources? And how do we deal with increasing pressure on a shared natural resource? My name is Mayra Aguilar. I grew up in San Juanico. I grew up in San Juanico was the best with all my family and then falling in love in an amazing small town uh, with a beautiful beach. And the first question that I ask everybody is, why, why do you like San Juanico? And they say, because it's an amazing place, really great waves, it's super easy, and then they really enjoy it. The, the weather too, is really good. Everybody loves the food. <laughs> I really want to help my town go visit and enjoy all the town, but also if they can help them help supporting with the medicine or bring materials for the schools because I was a teacher there and then sometimes we need a lot of materials and then I really love to um, to see new people visit to San Juanico but at the same time to be care the town
San Juanico sits at a critical junction between sustainable growth and wholesale mass tourism seen at other Mexican resorts like Cabo San Lucas. The point's popularity has drawn the government and big developer eyes to this dusty little surf outpost. The locals want to improve their standard of living while at the same time retaining the village character they've created. Surfers want the perfect wave and a Baja wilderness experience. How to set an example of small-scale, eco-friendly, artfully constructed development that others will value and want to emulate. How to instill a sense of legacy, a wave for seven generations. At San Diego State University's Center for Surf Research, there has been a decade-long study to understand the effects and impacts on globalized surfing tourism. One of the results has been the Framework Analysis for Sustainable Surf Tourism, also known as FAST. FAST main principles include the need for formal, long-term coordinated planning that recognizes limits to growth so that the recreational carrying capacities of surf breaks are not exceeded. Systematic attempts to foster cross-cultural understanding to empower and enable local communities to become involved with surf tourism if they choose, and to engender a sense of respect for local culture among visiting surfers. Village level surf sport development can help to empower local women and children and open commercial opportunities for local people to establish their own businesses in all facets of surf tourism service provision. So we're really most interested in broadening the base uh, through ecotourism and uh, you know we've now mapped out you know mountain bike trails and kitings become real big every afternoon. There's a lot of other things than just surfing that one break. I would have a European style small development with some architectural integrity that would surpass anything in Baja. It would be a special kind of surf place for moms to breed their kids and push kids into waves that they would never get anywhere else and, and have a, that kind of community that's, that's wholesome and sustainable. Lo que quiero decir a los visitantes de San Juan y a ser parte de él uh, como lo ha sido una gran familia y cuidarlo de la mejor manera es la mejor cosa que puedes aportar en el pueblo. As we move into the 21st century, the 35 million wave riders on this planet have a clear choice and an incredible opportunity to become legitimate stewards of their waves, beaches and culture. It takes the work of research, community organization and innovative models of surf tourism development for history to stop repeating itself. We as a culture and citizens of planet Earth need a new paradigm and owner's manual. Hopefully it's being written between sessions on a dusty Baja point as you watch this. Hopefully you are one of the authors.